Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we will be taking a deep dive into the research on intermittent fasting. So feel free to pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. We are gonna be talking about calories and macros, so please feel free to skip this video if that's not supportive to your journey. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out on a video. So before we get too far into it, let's start with a quick refresher on what intermittent fasting actually is. Basically, intermittent fasting involves abstaining from any caloric food or beverage for a designated period of time. Now, there are three main types of intermittent fasting, which will vary in terms of the length and frequency of the fast. For example, alternate day fasting involves alternating between feeding days and fasting days. So you might eat normally on Monday, fast Tuesday, eat again Wednesday, etc. Whole day fasting, otherwise known as the 5-2 method, involves eating normally for five days of the week and fasting or consuming very minimal calories for one to two days. Lastly, there's the most common version called time-restricted fasting, also known as the 16-8 method, which typically involves a 16-hour fast and an eight-hour eating window. All right, with that out of the way, let's kick off our FAQ, starting with the first major question. What, if anything, can you consume while you're fasting? Now there's no hard and fast rules when it comes to what you can eat during your eating window, but really like anything goes. But during a fast, you are expected to abstain from any food or beverage with any caloric value as this will ultimately break your fast. So that means obviously no food, but also no bone broth, alcohol, coconut water, milk, juice, protein powder, or even some supplements like branch chain amino acid. A lot of fasters will consume black coffee or tea, but this is actually a bit of a contested suggestion. Some researchers argue that caffeine actually alters your metabolism and therefore breaks the fast, while others argue that because it contains no calories, it's fair game. So ultimately, it really probably depends on your intentions and your goals with intermittent fasting. Next, let's talk about what happens in the body during a fasted state. So when you fast, your body is not getting any energy from food, which will ultimately cause your blood sugar and insulin levels to naturally decline. And insulin is often regarded as the fat storing hormone, a concept that I'm gonna unpack in a lot more detail in just a bit. However, your body still needs fuel to function and it's therefore gonna resort to other forms of energy. So first, the body will use up all of its stored glucose, aka glycogen, which generally takes about 24 hours to deplete. After that, the body begins to break down fat stores and use fat for energy, which is essentially what is involved when we talk about ketosis. Now, with that information in mind, let's talk about some frequently asked questions. Will you lose body fat while intermittent fasting? So proponents of intermittent fasting suggest that one of the main benefits of fasting is that it can help you shed body fat and ultimately, of course, lose weight. The thinking is that by keeping our insulin levels low for longer periods of time, we're reducing those fat storage opportunities and also for longer fasts, we're switching to utilize our fat stores for fuel. However, this doesn't automatically result in body fat loss. Whether or not you lose weight while intermittent fasting really depends on your total energy balance. In other words, what and how much you eat, as well as how much you move throughout the day. So for example, if you're expending a lot of energy throughout your day and your intake is low during your eating window, this will likely result in weight loss because you're putting yourself into a caloric deficit. In contrast, if you feel hungrier during your eating window and therefore you eat more and move less, this likely will not result in any weight loss and even could potentially result in weight gain. So if there's no difference between how much you exercise and how much you eat, but that you're simply shifting the time when you eat, 
then you very well could just maintain your weight despite doing intermittent fasting. This variability in weight loss outcomes while intermittent fasting has been seen in a recent 2020 study on time-restricted fasting, which showed that on average, people do tend to lose weight while intermittent fasting, but we also see a lot of people maintaining their weight or gaining weight as well. So bottom line, intermittent fasting does not automatically equate to weight loss just because of fat metabolism or the reduction in insulin spikes. Now, with that said, this brings us to our next question. Why do most people lose weight while intermittent fasting? So the reason why we might see weight loss while intermittent fasting has less to do with using body fat for energy or keeping insulin levels low and more to do with the fact that people are just likely to eat less. While deliberate caloric restriction isn't built into the diet, meaning you could theoretically eat whatever you want during your eating window, a lot of people just don't fully compensate for you know, their fasted meals during that eating window. So yeah, apparently a lot of us are just not so great at making up fully for the meals that we skip. For example, one study on whole day fasting found that while participants did eat more calories than baseline after a 36 hour fast, the extra calories were not nearly enough to make up for all of the calories that they missed during that long fast. So for example, if you need 2000 calories a day to maintain your weight and you eat nothing on Monday, but then you eat 3000 calories on Tuesday, that still would be a 1000 calorie deficit overall. That could result in significant weight loss over time, depending on how often you were to fast. Now to tie this all together, is intermittent fasting better than continuous caloric restriction when it comes to losing weight? So in general, there's actually not much of a difference between intermittent fasting and other calorically restrictive diets when it comes to weight loss. For example, studies have shown that when an individual is in a caloric deficit from intermittent fasting or from just general calorie counting and maintaining a deficit, they tend to lose weight at the same rate. One 2017 study compared alternate day fasting and continuous caloric restriction. Even though both groups had the same weekly caloric deficit of 25%, the study found no difference in weight loss, further confirming that it's really the deficit and not anything magical happening metabolically that results in that weight loss. In addition, the research suggests that the amount of weight lost during intermittent fasting and daily caloric restriction is relatively the same, with one study showing that intermittent fasting resulted in a 4 to 8% weight loss in three weeks, and caloric restriction resulted in a 5 to 8% weight loss. So if weight loss is your goal, but you find that intermittent fasting is just not very sustainable to you in the long term, you won't be missing out on its potential weight loss benefits if you follow an alternate diet that is just a better fit for your lifestyle. Next up on the FAQ, does intermittent fasting reduce insulin levels? So as discussed, one of the asserted benefits of intermittent fasting is that it keeps levels of the fat storing hormone insulin lower. It's often suggested that every single time we eat, the spike in insulin can stimulate the body to immediately store fat. But I want to elaborate a little bit more on this idea of insulin as the big bad fat storing hormone. Insulin's main role in the body is actually to help our cells absorb glucose for fuel. When our glucose stores are full, insulin will then store any excess glucose essentially as fat. So even though insulin does play a role in body fat storage, this is only going to occur when we consume more energy, aka calories, than what our body actually needs. In other words, any increase in body fat has more to do with what and how much we're eating and whether or not we are eating beyond our needs. This goes back to what we already discussed earlier. So for example, if someone were to consume more food than what they actually normally would eat during their eating window, this would cause a big spike in insulin and may increase the likelihood that excess glucose would be stored as body fat. 
And this may likely be the case for those individuals who experience ravenous hunger and therefore weight gain during intermittent fasting. I also want to point out that when it comes to insulin spikes, carbs tend to be villainized the most as we do know that carbs break down into glucose, which then stimulates the release of insulin. However, I want to actually clarify that protein also stimulates insulin, especially things like dairy, beef, beans, and fish. And some protein foods can even actually be more insulin stimulating than some carbohydrate foods. This speaks to why it's recommended that you avoid protein shakes and BCAAs during a fast. So now that we know that body fat storage has less to do with insulin and more to do with how much we eat in response to hunger, does intermittent fasting benefit insulin sensitivity? So if you're unfamiliar with the term insulin sensitivity, it basically refers to how sensitive your body's cells are in response to insulin. A higher insulin sensitivity essentially means that your cells are able to use glucose more effectively which will reduce blood sugar levels. So this is definitely a positive thing as low insulin sensitivity, otherwise known as insulin resistance, can be a precursor to type 2 diabetes. Now, when it comes to the effect of intermittent fasting on insulin sensitivity, it seems to depend on the length of the fast and the timing of the eating window. One 2010 study showed that a prolonged 60 hour fast resulted in lower insulin sensitivity upon feeding, meaning that even though blood sugar and insulin levels were low throughout the fast, reintroducing food during the eating window resulted in lower rates of glucose uptake. This is not ideal because that means that the glucose that isn't being efficiently absorbed stays in the bloodstream, resulting in higher blood sugar levels, which is not good. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! Ideally, we want our cells to be sensitive to insulin so that we can actually maximize the use of glucose for fuel. However, keep in mind that this study looked at a prolonged fast, which may or may not mimic the types of intermittent fasting that most of your favorite influencers actually do. On the other hand, another study looked at an intermittent fasting approach where participants consumed one meal during a four hour eating window from four to 8 p.m. This study found that consuming one meal per day later on in the evening also resulted in lower insulin sensitivity meaning there was less glucose being absorbed for energy from this meal. Again, not what we want. However, when we look at meals consumed earlier in the day, we actually don't see the same effect. One 2018 study looking at time-restricted fasting found that participants experienced increased insulin sensitivity when they consumed their meal earlier on in the day. With that said, insulin sensitivity appears to be highest in the morning and declines throughout the day. And this goes for everyone, regardless of whether you are intermittent fasting or not. A lot of this has to do with our natural circadian alignment. In other words, our sleep and wake cycles. So if we can align our food intake during daylight hours when our insulin sensitivity is at its peak, it may actually benefit our metabolism and glucose response. Therefore, intermittent fasters would benefit from scheduling their eating window closer to the morning rather than the evening and avoiding more prolonged fasting periods. Next up, can a fasted workout improve muscle mass? Some proponents of intermittent fasting have suggested that intermittent fasting can support muscle growth after a workout. While we do have mechanisms in the body to prevent muscle wasting during a period of starvation or fasting, these mechanisms don't really kick in until around day five of a fast, which means that during short-term intermittent fasting, muscle mass is not really being protected and could potentially break down. In fact, the longer the fasting window, the more muscle breakdown will occur. For instance, muscle breakdown is highest for whole day fasts and alternate day fasts. With time-restricted fasts with, you know, two to three meals a day, these are typically better able to support muscle synthesis, assuming that, of course, you're eating enough during your eating window. However, a recent 2020 study suggested that individuals participating in time-restricted fasting still can experience a one to five pound loss in muscle mass 
during a 12 week period. If muscle building is your goal, intermittent fasting may not be your best bet. It's also worth noting that you can't necessarily compensate for the increased rate of muscle breakdown just by consuming a really big, big protein meal after your fast. This is because the body can only utilize a certain amount of protein for muscle synthesis, the remainder of which is then used for fuel and is not stored in muscle tissue. So if your goal is muscle growth, ideally you want that protein that you consume to be used for muscle tissue instead of energy. However, in order to achieve this, you would really want to be increasing the number of meals and snacks consumed per day and eating regularly, like every three to four hours, which would unfortunately present a conflict with intermittent fasting. This is why traditional fitness competitor diets have folks eating like, I don't know, like a million meals from morning to night. Just second breakfast, lunch, second lunch, and first dinner. Now to round out this FAQ on intermittent fasting, let's discuss some of the key takeaways. One, if intermittent fasting suits your lifestyle and aligns with your natural hunger cues, it may be able to be used somewhat successfully as a tool for weight loss. However, keep in mind that results may vary and it's not that much different from any other calorically restrictive diet. Number two, any body fat loss from intermittent fasting has less to do with low insulin levels and using fat for fuel and more to do with the likelihood of being in a caloric deficit from a restricted eating window. Number three, to improve insulin sensitivity, you should aim to schedule your eating window earlier on in the day and avoid prolonged fasts. And four, most athletes whose goal is to improve muscle mass or strength should maybe avoid intermittent fasting as it may increase the likelihood of muscle breakdown. Older adults and of course those who struggle with disordered eating should also avoid intermittent fasting. And folks, that is all that I have for you guys today. If you like this video, please be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on what you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.